Hi, everyone. My name is Patty Van Capellen. I'm a psychologist and a researcher, and I don't drink enough water. I mean, I like water, but I'd rather see the glass half full than the glass half empty. And that's what I do in my work as well. I study how faith and spirituality intertwine with flourishing and profound experiences of awe, gratitude, or hope. But today I will drink some water and talk to you about something more somber, human suffering. Now, human suffering is everywhere, and we're frequently exposed to it. For me, this manifests every morning as I'm driving to my office at Duke University. I'm in my car either singing or chatting with my parents who are still in Belgium and six hours ahead of me. And on my way, there is one particular light that just loves watching me stop. It always turns red, and so I stop. And most mornings, there will be a person standing next to my car, holding a sign asking for help. I have no doubt this person knows suffering, but in that moment, I face a choice. Do I look away and pretend this person isn't even there? Or do I offer them something, even just a smile, to show that I care? I'll admit, my choice isn't the same every morning, and it's probably not the same as the other drivers behind me. We've all been through such situations. We know we are compassionate people. We each have a glass of compassion in our hands. But it's hard to pour it. It requires effort, can be emotionally overwhelming, and it doesn't come with free refills. So what makes us choose to pour the compassion glass? And what makes us pour more of it? In my research, I focus on the scientific study of religion. I love dissecting religion, understanding the beliefs, the practices, the experiences that come with it, and that can so profoundly shape our psychology. So naturally, I've been asking, does religiosity influence people's compassion glass and what they do with it? Historically, we know that religious institutions have played a central role in providing compassionate services to their communities. And across all world religions, compassion for those who are suffering is a central value. But does this value translate into actual responses? Well, to answer this question, we can ask people, how important is religion in your life? How frequently do you practice your faith? And then, how frequently do you generally care about others? When we do that, we see that as religiosity increases, compassion responses does too. That's great, but hard to trust. People want to present themselves in a good light, of course. So we need more fine-grained measures and stringent tests. So I'll walk you through one such test. On a computer, we present participants with two decks of cards, and we give them two pieces of information. One, we tell them that they're going to be shown real pictures taken from news coverage of people affected by the war in Ukraine. And two, we tell them that they first need to make a choice about how to engage with these pictures. Do they want to care or do they want to describe? If they choose care, they're asked to be uh, compassionate and to generate warm feelings and caring for the person in the picture. If they choose to describe, they're asked to be objective. Focus on the external features of the person. Describe their age and gender. So participants make their choice, care or describe, and then they see the picture and answer a few questions. And then the task resets. And we ask again, care or describe. And we repeat this decision and picture display many times to get a valid measurement of their choice and also to mimic frequent exposure to suffering, like when we watch the news, or like my daily red light dilemma, but without the conversation with your parents' part. This choice is about whether people even get themselves in a situation where they could pour their compassion glass. We take a second piece of measurement in the same test. We ask participants after seeing each picture 
to rate how concerned they are for the person. This is about how much compassion they display, how much of the glass they pour. So here are the results. First of all, across all of the trials, how many times do people choose to care and instead of describe? Of course, there are different profiles. Some people pick one option and tend to stick with it, but most people flip-flop between the two. The point is that on average, people will choose to care only 26% of the time. That's in about a quarter of the trial. This may be a bit shocking, but it has been shown across many studies and across different contexts of human suffering. Why? Not because humans are awful, I mean maybe, but because as I said, compassion is not easy. It requires effort and can be emotionally overwhelming. And because of those psychological costs, we regulate our response and don't always pour the compassion glass. When I see this number, I also think we have a lot of room for improvement. And what's exciting is that I do find that religiosity is associated with choosing to care more often. So let's take one measure of religiosity. Is religion important in your life? From zero, not at all, to eight, extremely. Well, if people move just one point up on the scale, they will choose to care 2% more of the time. Now that's something, you know, as I said, I like looking at the glass half full, particularly considering that I did not remind these participants of their faith before doing the task. I also find that as their religiosity increases, their level of concern for people affected by the war in Ukraine increases as well. And this is important because care and concern can drive helping behaviors. Now this is a new project for me and, and thank you Templeton Philanthropies for currently funding it. But I'm seeing these patterns of results across all of the studies that I've done so far. What I don't see is for religiosity to be associated with empathy as defined as feeling the same difficult emotion as the person in the picture. So if we do this exact same task, but ask participants, do you want to describe or feel feeling the same emotion as the person? Then religiosity is not associated with choice to feel. Religiosity is not associated with being upset for the person or just like the person. Really, the action is between religion and compassion as defined as care and concern for suffering. I still have many more questions, and as a psychologist, I, of course, want to understand exactly how religion gets under the skin to influence people's compassion. For example, I'd be looking at specific religious practices. Does collective worship, or the practice of praying for people who suffer in the world, provide the right experiences, like frequent exposure to compassion in a safe and supportive context. And that may change people's perceptions of compassion as this thing that's not that overwhelming or to be avoided at all costs. And hopefully these practices over time can make people choose to be compassionate more. Of course, being religious is not a reality for everyone. And as a scientist, I certainly don't want to send the message that everybody should convert now, yet. By understanding how religion brings these benefits, we can identify the psychological mechanisms through which we can build more compassionate societies, even outside religious contexts. So I'll leave you on this glass half full note. I'll encourage all of us to drink some water today and to consider pouring the rest of it for others. Thank you.